Hi everyone, welcome to the third Craft and Cook show. Hope you're having a lovely Wednesday evening if you're watching this live. We've actually decided to film early Monday morning this week due to, uh, it is the what of August? It's like the fourth, third of August. And um, in Melbourne today, we're going into hard lockdown. So we don't think it will affect our business as much for Chandler's Cottage. But remember, we do have the textile pantry, which is our wholesale business. And we're a little bit concerned about maybe a deadline to get orders out to our the shops that are customers all over Australia. So Kate's dragged me out of bed early. We're here at eight o'clock on Monday morning. This is the perfect recipe to do today though, because it's fast and it's easy. It started out as the apricot and walnut slice. Now, this old book here is from one of our craft shows, uh, cook shows that we had years and years ago, and we had a little cafe and we put all of my mum and my favourite recipes into it. You can see the state of the book. It is disgusting, it's been used to death, and mine is the left handed version because Rob got tired one night and bound it on the wrong side, so he gave it to me. It's the left hand version. So we're going to make that one today, but we're going to revamp it and we're going to call it the pantry slice because it's the perfect one to grab everything out of the pantry that's left over from making different cakes and slices and cookies um, and throwing them into this slice to use them up. So let's get started and I'll show you what goes in. First of all, we need to melt some butter. Now, it just can just be normal salted butter and I love it when a recipe says 125 grams because I don't have to weigh it, I can just cut a 250 gram piece in half. And invariably I will make two batches of this recipe because it freezes really well. I'm gonna pass that over to Kate. She's gonna throw it in for 30 seconds, I think. So while she's doing that, we will um, pop our dry ingredients in. Now you're going to need a cup of self-raising flour. I went out and bought these new, or got really shonky looking um, mixing, uh, sorry, measuring cups at the moment. Because I want to buy some really nice ones, but I can't go shopping. So these came from the $2 shop down the road. So it's a cup of self-raising flour. I also bought new containers when we moved house at the start of the year, and I was going to make really nice labels for them. But you know what? My grandmother used to get me, a bit more please, Kate, Another 25. My grandmother used to make me sit down for her and cut all of the labels off the flower boxes that came in boxes and put them in. So I still like to do this. It's just my little connection with my grandmother. So a cup of self-raising flour and then we're going to do half a cup of plain flour. This recipe is very tolerant of variation. So that means if you're a little bit over, a little bit under. It may come up a little bit different each time, but it will be okay. You're never going to get a disaster. So half a cup of plain, and then three quarters of a cup of sugar. I'm using caster sugar. I always use caster sugar these days, but if you've got normal sugar, then that's perfectly fine. Don't go to super, thanks, okay. Don't go to brown sugar though because it's going to be too much moisture for the recipe and you will lose the tolerance of adding all the flavorings in that you want. So there and there, we'll set that to the side. Now this is our melted butter and into here we are just going to add a great big dollop, technically called a dessert spoonful. No Ginny! No, get down. We're not editing her out this week. Everyone needs to know she's not cute, she's naughty. All right, so that's our dessert spoonful of golden uh, syrup. Okay, now I'll pop that there for a minute. So into this bowl, now we've got our dry ingredients. This is the fun bit. We can add whatever we like. So I, the original recipe said half a cup of apricots and half a cup of walnuts chopped. So this is technically what we can do. Officially, we have it all here. Oh, see how small those apricots are? Right, so obviously I didn't chop those. I wanted the apricots to show you today. So I went down to buy some and came back with them. And then remembered I'd sent all my knives and all my scissors off to get sharpened on Saturday, thinking I'd have them back in time for the show. So I had to only work with a bread knife. 
So I went back and bought pre-chopped ones because that's just way too hard. So um, walnuts and apricots are a good combo to put in, but look here as well. This is probably, this is my favorite kind of Christmas look. I've got cranberries and white chocolate and some slithers of almond that have still got their skin on them. So you get a really nice uh, color to them and contrast. And then um, this is another one. This is Philip's favorite. He's due home from night shift soon, so I'm sure he'll want me to make up this combo. Chocolate, milk chocolate, and I've got um, glazed, uh, crystallized ginger, and some sultanas. Now you can see, these are very sad looking sultanas. They're old, and they've been in the cupboard. That's a great thing about this slice, is you use up all the leftovers. In fact, if you take all those bits that get left in the bottom of the jar, and you put them all into one big jar, and give it a good shake, that's gonna be what you put in your slice next week. So I think I'm going to work with this one today because Phil will want some when he gets back. So we're going to pop that in. So it says half a cup of apricots and half a cup of walnuts and that's what I'll put on the recipe card for you today. But a cup of anything is going to work. Um, hazelnuts, don't get me started, I could just keep giving you different combinations. This kept me in good stead right through the boys' school years because I could make it ahead of time and put it into the freezer all packed off ready for them and I'll be honest if you like something sweet late at night when you cut it up cut some little pieces up for yourself just to have a bite size of chopping and pop them in the freezer because it's really nice straight from the freezer as well all right there is our butter and our golden syrup in so we're going to mix all this together and then Kate can you pass me an egg from the windowsill thank you we're going to pop one egg in here just to hold it all together. I think you can dress this up, this slice, into a dessert as well. Um, Leanne was over a couple of weeks ago in the morning and uh, we went for a walk at work and I took it in warm from the oven and I had some big chunks of dark chocolate in it and some hazelnuts and it was just really lovely. So we had it warm with a big dollop of Greek yogurt on the side and a drizzle of honey, and that was great. So we're doing this first this morning, and then we're going to go to the warehouse because I was going to film on Wednesday and I haven't got everything done. But also, we, there's a, so much I want to show you today, it's going to be better if I do it in the studio. And in terms of specials, if you're watching us live, we've just gone overboard with specials so we've got a lot to get through all right so can you see that that looks really yummy and gooey so we'll pop it into our tray just a standard slice tray is all that you need I've put some uh, oil spray on first so I can hold it'll hold down my baking paper and it's good to have a little bit extra on the sides for us to lift it out when it's finished I'm just going to pop that in there a big do lot like that Now, you're going to want to use your fingers to spread this out. It doesn't have to be super smooth on the top. In fact, it is really good if your fingers are a little bit wet with warm water. You can spread it out. There we go. That is it. So I'm going to pop that one into the oven. Then we're going to get the car packed and we're going to head off to the warehouse. Okay, this has had 25 minutes in the oven at 180 degrees and then I've pulled it out for about five minutes just to let it cool enough so it's firm. Your slice is gonna come out different each time if you mess around with the ingredients and it doesn't matter. Mine's come up really nice and caramelly brown today so I think it's gonna be good. I know it's ready to turn out and I can put my hands on the top of it and it's not too hot. So what I want you to do is use the sides to lift it out like that and then it's good to cut onto a board um remember i've only got the bread knife that's probably going to work to my advantage the other thing too just i'll mention now if you wanted to if you leave larger pieces of nuts and fruit in there 
Sometimes it's better to actually flip your slice over when it's completely cold so that you're cutting from the bottom to the top of the slice and then you'll find as you cut down into it, if you've got big lovely chunks of nuts or things in there, they won't get pushed down to the bottom of the slice and distort the shape of it while you cut it, if that makes sense. When we get to doing fudge slices and stuff later on, you know I'm going to pull out a ruler, don't you? And a rotary cutter to cut it. So they're all perfect two inch squares. We've got that. Okay. So let's get this cut. Now, actually, yeah, the bread knife is a good one. When I um, cut this up for lunches or to take somewhere as well, I like doing nice long skinny pieces. But this will just cut into a classic. Um, 9 to 12 piece um, slice like that. So I've got 12 lovely pieces to take with us. I think we'll take some to work to eat as well and we can pop some into the warehouses to the boys next door and we're good to go. Here comes the cat again. Unbelievable. Alright, we're back in the warehouse in the studio now. I've had a little piece of slice and a cuppa, so I'm good to go and I hope you are too. So what I wanted to talk about this evening are three really fun things and that is using ombre fabrics and ruching and how to use and design your own shapes for using metal and bag purse frames. So three great things to play with. But first of all, if you watched last week, I promised, promised that I would have a project finished using the 3D pedals that we did last week. I didn't know at the time that we were going to have to film two days earlier. So could you please just, just look, overhead shot, look at that. They are half finished and I've spent ages um, and had a lot of fun making these. And these ones on this side, I'm just going to gather their bases up. So if you didn't see last week's, please go back and have a look at craft and cook show number two so you can see how to make petals and 3D flowers. Uh, and then these ones on this side, I'm going to embellish. Uh, I've got the bejeweler out, I've got beads out, I'm going to use embroidery threads and, um, and get them all done. So I'm so, so sorry I've broken my promise, but I didn't know we were going to be short 48 hours. But they'll be finished for next week. And next week, they're going to go onto this bag. Now, it's very, very quickly. Just show you, I have my panels ready to go. If you have... Uh, a tote pattern that's a nice big one uh, like this one here which is my Chinatown tote you could design your own if you wanted to to put 3d flowers onto as I am I'm just rearranging the dimensions of the pieces that are on the panel so instead of having two thin bits top and bottom and a wide in the middle I'm having a great big bit of floral and then I'm having a wide bit of uh, the black at the top to put all of my 3D flowers onto. Next week we're talking about how to assemble bags using a wraparound base technique. So it's perfect timing really, but we'll come back and get all of those together in next week's show. So back to what we were gonna talk about tonight. Ombre fabrics. Now, um, in the first show I wore this scarf and I wish I had designed it because I had so many people say, Lisa, where'd you get your scarf or are they one of your designs? No, it's not. I bought it in Singapore, but it's a really good one to show you because we're talking about ombre fabrics. And if you have a look at this, this scarf is ombre. So that just means there is a subtle shift in color or in shading in a fabric, a wallpaper, a scarf, anything. And this one changes colors, but it may just be that it changes shades. So. I will smugly put this away because it's mine and you can't have it, but um, it, I might turn it into a fabric design one day. So let's have a look at some ombre fabrics. We're going to make some of these little ruched flowers to tonight with this particular fabric. So I'll show you the fabric first. You can see it changes color across the bolt. Uh, it goes from from red through to yellow in the middle and then it will mirror image. Sometimes you'll get them that change from dark to light, but this particular one changes in the middle. The dark to light right across the bolt are really good to use for backgrounds, for applique as well. So that's a purple one just to show you. Imagine lavender, the 3D petals that we're working on at the moment. And this one is a beautiful yellow green and I'm in love with this one at the moment. I'm going to use this for stem and leaves in a couple of projects coming up. I'm going to pop the purple and the green away because that's just toys. 
you can play with them later. And I'll pull out this one again that we're using today to make these flowers. One thing that people find when they talk about uh, making ruched flowers or cutting bias is they get really confused about how to cut the fabric. So I'm going to show you the easiest way to do it. Now, I'm when I'm buying ombre fabrics or when I'm looking at using them, I like to work with a fat quarter or a half a metre because I know that's going to give me a good representation of the shading right across the bolt or where it changes in the middle. And it's going to give me pieces that are long enough. There's lots of fancy ways to cut bias, cut a metre, join it here, there, everywhere, cut your bias, you'll end up with heaps. That's all brilliant. But for the flowers that we're making today, we really only need strips that are about 20 inches long. So working with a fat quarter or half a metre is going to give you enough. So I've cut a half and because this fabric does change in the middle, I'm going to cut it down to a fat quarter and pop the other piece away to use later. Now, if you're going to cut this into bias strips, all you need to do is turn it onto point. That's it. Then it's not going to fit on your board, so fold it up. That's it. Then just cut right through using your board for markings. I'm going to go with two inch strips today. That'll give me a really good classic ruche. I've got the wrong side of the fabric showing at the moment. That's right. You can work with lots of different thicknesses depending on what you're doing. But two's a really good benchmark place to start. Okay, that gives us three to work with now. Now, the leftover pieces that you're going to get on each side that you won't find are long enough to use for whatever project you're doing, you're still going to use them. And we're going to use them as a base for our flowers. I'll pop that there for a tick. So, have a look at that. So, you've got some beautiful colour shading happening with your ombre and it's going to be perfect for ruching up. The next thing that we do need to do is iron it. So I've got our little ironing board here. You know that one I promised last week I'd cover before now? So it's a bit grotty but it just means it's loved and it's seen a lot of happy patchwork. Okay. A good steam iron is what you're going to need. So we're going to fold in just both sides into the middle with the wrong side facing up. If you are going to use a, a nice thin fabric, then you will be fine with just a steam. But if you're using a thicker one, um, or one that's got a lot of metallic like some of mine, a little bit of best press starch is going to help keep those edges folded over while you work on it. Okay, there we go. So now that we've got our edges folded over, our strip is now half the size that it was. It's now down to uh, one inch wide. And to get a classic ruche, if the piece is one inch wide, you're going to want to mark it on one side at one inch intervals. So if I just mark that You're going to end up with a repertoire of pens when you're doing this because depending on whether you're using a light or a dark fabric, you might need to use a friction pen or, or even a chalk pencil. I've got some marked up with that at the moment. So I would mark all of that piece at one inch intervals and then you're going to come back on the other side and mark it at one inch again, but they're going to be in between the first ones. So you can see that there. So you've got one inch on one side and then in between one inch on the other side. And what that's doing, it's setting us up so that we're going to be able to do a zigzag gather stitch. Now, because I do have to get this project done to show you, um, I've got some more here that are already marked up. So I've got long ones here that are already done. I can show you there. 
And you can see they're all going to be just a little bit different on, based on where they were cut from the fabric, so that's going to be great. <clears throat> I've got a knotted thread here. Make it a strong one please folks because you need it to put a little bit of tension and weight onto the thread for doing this project. Again, if you've got a hand quilting thread, you could use that as well. Okay, let's get a close up. So, what I'm going to do is a little gathering stitch, but not too close together. I want them quite big. Can you see that? So, they're about just under a quarter of an inch gap between your stitches. When you get to the edge, I want you to stop short of the edge and bring the thread up and over the edge of the fabric. So you're actually going to have a little loop that sits over the edge. Pull up every time that you uh, get to the other side. Oh, I went a bit wonky there. There we go. So it's going to pull up as you go across. Great little thing to do again in front of the television sitting outside in our upcoming sunshine for spring or if you're in Espanola in autumn sorry Maria so I'm just going to keep pulling that up and see that little ruche is all happening and do pull up as you go because if you leave it till the end the strip's going to be too hard to pull up too much tension on your thread and you won't get a really nice gather so I'm going to go all the way to the end of that piece and again with the ombre, it's really good fun because it changes across the, the strip as you go. So it's constantly changing in front of your eyes. Right. I'll set that one aside. Okay, so this is where I get the fun bit where I get to say, here's some I prepared earlier because I do need to get a lot more made for the project I want to make with you next week. Now, can you see those? So I've done quite a few of them and depending on where they were cut from the bolt, they've all come up slightly different, which is really good fun. Right, so these little scrap pieces that we've cut from the same fabric, we're now going to tack our ruching onto them. So if you can see there, about in the middle of that piece of fabric, I'm going to start using tacking stitches that will go down between the folds. So you won't even see them. Then once you've got it secured down, I want you to start turning it so that it turns into a spiral shape, just with a couple of tacking stitches as you go. You see that? And then you just keep working your way around. You'll come back over the start of your ruching strip and conceal it, and it will just slowly, slowly build up like that. Now when you get to the end, you're going to be able to tuck last little piece underneath. It's a, just a nice little process to sit and do by hand and I'll also show you with these ones that I've already done. This one here. You can see on the back all that leftover fabric from that little scrap piece. Fold that under and tack it up underneath and it, it gives it a little bit more structure and, and it puffs it out just a little bit as well and then you'll be able to take that flower on mass and tack it onto your handbag or your cushion or whatever you want to use it for. For me, when I see these, the first thing I want to do is put them onto a little purse and probably one that's about this size or a little bit smaller. I've got a smaller one I'm going to show you today. So you can just imagine having that in a matching fabric. Oh, that's the same colour as our background. Um, you can just pop it over the top like that. So cute. This little purse has got some little bead embellishments on it over the flowers, but you could also add some in over the ruching too if you wanted to. All right, so what I'd like to show you next is just a couple of tricks on using metallic frames. There's so much that we can cover with this, but for this week, I thought we would just start with a nice little purse frame that's going to work well with your ruched flowers. So I've got a little one here to show you. Got it sitting here in silver. These are great frames um, and in fact I will just sneakily say we've just started uh, stocking these ones. They're a little bit smaller than the ones we've had before so they're a nice little trinket purse. The best ones to get are the ones that have got the holes in them so that you can sew them on much easier than the gluing ones. So how do you work out the size of the panels for your purses? Let's have a look. I'm going to pop that down there 
One of the easiest things to use is just a piece of cord. So we'll cut this off here. I've got a piece to work with. I pop a knot in one end and then I sit it against the hinge on one side and roll the cord. You could use a piece of string or um, a thick piece of wool, I suppose, as well. But roll that up so it sits inside the frame. I'm going to hold it with my fingers there and pull it out. And then I know that that is the actual, the length, if you like, of the curve or the straight edge from the first panel that I'm going to make. So if I sit that on my board, I can see, oh, that's exactly five inches, so that's perfect. And then when I come to design the actual panel for my purse, I'm going to want to work. Can you see that okay? I know it's white on white, sorry about that. But that's the size that I'm going to want. So let me just chop this off. Now, one little trick. To get a good curve, go to the kitchen. Here is my plate that has the leftover of my slice on it that we made this morning, but it's a good example to show you. Actually, I'm gonna take the slice off. I'm gonna wipe the crumbs off and then turn it over. There you go. So, look at that. I can actually use that to give me a really nice curve for the panel that's going to go into my purse. Alternatively, I might use a mug or something else to give me my curve and it needs to be that long. So if I mark that here and here, like that, then I know that's my five inches and I can draw a line around. And that is the top of my purse panel. As simple as that. Now what are we going to do from there? Well, you've got a few options. You could actually get another plate or something else and do your curve. I'm just going to sketch it on to show you so that your purse has a curve on it. A little bit like this one that I've already made to go in. Or you could go straight. So you just get your ruler and go down and make a straight one, like this one. So that hopefully will get you started on metallic frames. Now, when we come back next week and we've got some bigger bags and things to finish off with the techniques we're going to look at, we'll work with these ones. Same principle, We'll put the cord up inside and work out how big we want our bag panels to be at the top to pop into these. Um, we've also got another gorgeous one that I'm going to use. Oh, look at that one. Can you see that one with the hinge on the top? Just beautiful. But I digress. Let's move on. Okay. So when you've got your bag panels all worked out, two for the outside of your purse, put a little bit of pellet on them, and then you're going to sew them around the long side or the long base around here, right round. Leave the top open. Do the same with your lining for me. And then I want you to sit the lining inside your outer bag right sides together. So right around the top. I forgot to say what I always forget to do, leave an opening in the lining to turn it through. So it's just like you're making a normal handbag, but this is gonna give you your finished purse if you like, a little flap there at the top, all ready to go and then it's ready to sew into your frame. There really isn't a super duper easy way to put them in. They are a little bit awkward. I do find sometimes it's easier to use a peg to hold them in place when I start. When we get to the big frames later on, yes then definitely we'll use some pegs or some bull clips. But for these little ones what I'd like you to do is just find the centre of one side, like that. I've got my little pin, you see my little pin in there. And then I'm going to put my thread with a knot in it up through there as well. So it's ready to go. Then I can take the pin out and sit my frame over the top. Like that. So the main, the main thing you're going to want to do is make sure that you get the rim of your purse right up into the little cavity that sits at the back, at the back of your frame. So this just means me sitting down with um, a cover 
and sewing it on with the back stitch, which I'm going to do now. And while I'm doing that, uh, you might like to have a think about what you're going to make. Okay, so I've finished sewing one of my purses that you've just had a quick look at and I have one more to do so I will get this done before I see you next time. Now if you're staying with us for the specials and you're watching it live tonight, I've got some lovely things. I think there's about 20 specials out there. So there's lots to see and they do include some of the ombre fabrics that I've featured in tonight's show. Also, uh, thank you for putting up with us being a little bit all over the place today, but because we're getting ready for lockdown for COVID, we wanted to get our filming done early. But the advantage is I've worked out what we're doing next week. And as I mentioned, we'll be doing wraparound um, base assembly for handbags. So I just wanted to give you a sneak peek. This is uh, the panels that I've been creating for next week's project with ombre for my stems. And the flowers that we did earlier tonight, they are going to go on those stems. Can you see that? Okay, I'll hold that up for you. So you see, oh, they're going to slide. That's okay. But you can see I've had a lot of fun making these lovely bright flowers. And we'll be working on making a handbag with those with the panels next week. Also, if you're watching live on Wednesday night, please do remember the Great Australian Craft Show starts tomorrow. So please log on to the Craft Alive website. We do have a store there at the virtual show. And there are lots more specials on top of what you're seeing this evening. So again, thanks very much. Have a great week. Stay safe and I'll see you next Wednesday night.